We're talking about it, and we're talking about doing something for them, but we're really looking at, at the conclusion. We want to just — we don't want to focus on that now. They're incredible. There's, they're not saying we're not doing it. They go in with good equipment, with great equipment, and with stuff that's not so good. And sometimes they catch it wearing the best stuff you can buy, brand new, the best stuff. This is a very tough enemy. Uh, but these are uh, amazing people. No, we are talking about something, but we're really thinking about let's get it finished first before we do that. Please. Uh, the Surgeon General this morning was talking about the coming week being among the hardest and saddest uh, weeks of our lives. Tough, he was talking about week. this being our uh, Pearl Harbor, our 9 11 moment. You all are talking about glimmers of hope and stabilization. How are the American people supposed to? bridge those different descriptions that they're getting from this administration? I don't think they're so different. I think we all know that we have to reach a certain point, and that point is going to be a horrific point in terms of death. But it's also a point at which things are going to start changing. Uh, we're getting very close to that level right now, and uh, the next week and a half, two weeks are going to be uh, — I think they're going to be very difficult at the same time. We understand what they represent and what that time represents, and hopefully we can uh, get this over with, because this is a very horrible thing for the world. And look, we're one country out of 182 now that have 182 countries. I have a friend of mine that he didn't know we had so many countries in the world. 182 countries are now affected by this. So uh, we want to get it over with. Okay? Please. Those numbers, sir? Could I just ask one follow-up yes. on those numbers that you were talking about earlier? How does that change the projections that you were making earlier this week of 100 to 1,000 well, to 240? We hope we can stay under those numbers. Those are numbers of death, and we hope we can stay under those numbers. That would be uh, terrific, and as far under those numbers as possible. Now, we did nothing. You know that number, too. Uh, but the American people really stepped up. So did the professionals. They just really stepped up. So we're hoping to stay under those numbers. And that means the minimum and the maximum, but we're hoping to stay under the minimum number. You know what that number was. Right. But do the numbers that you were talking about today, have they changed those projections? Uh, I would say the answer is yes, but I would also say that we're not going to know really in terms of a final a toll until we get out to the end. And, and we're probably, possibly not so far away. We're getting closer. Uh, but it's our goal to stay as far under that minimum number, the minimum number as possible, okay? That's what we want to do. Go ahead. Mr. President, as President of the United States, your words carry enormous weight in this country and around the world. And while you acknowledge you're not a physician, you do promote these medicines extensively here. How do you not go so far as to be giving medical advice? And you said yesterday you might take some of these medicines, even though you don't have symptoms, are you still planning to do that? And how do you calibrate being enthusiastic yeah. and not playing doctor? Because I want people to live, and I'm seeing people dying. And I have seen people that are going to die without it. And you know the expression, when that's happening, they should do it. What really do we have to lose? We also have — this medicine's been tested for many years for malaria and for lupus, so it's been out there. So it's a very strong, powerful medicine, but it doesn't kill people. We have some very good results and some very good tests. You've seen the same test that I have. Uh, really in France, they had a very good test. They're continuing. But we don't have time to go and say, gee, let's take a couple of years and test it out, and let's go and test with the test tubes and the laboratories. We don't have time. I'd love to do that. But we have people dying today. As we speak, there are people dying. If it works, that would be great. If it doesn't work, we know for many years malaria, it, it's incredible what it's done for malaria. It's incredible what it's done for lupus, but it doesn't kill people. That's one of the things with a vaccine. When we have a vaccine, we have to do tests because when you inject that vaccine, when they take whatever it is they have to take, we have to make sure it doesn't have a horrible impact. Destroy somebody could. So we have to test it for long period of time. This one, not so much because it's been out there. Now, I'm not acting as a doctor. I'm saying, do what you want. But there are some good signs. You've read the signs. I've read the signs. With the other one, there's some very good signs also, different 
going together works very well. But there may be an indication that if you have a problem with your heart, you shouldn't take what we call the ZPAC. You shouldn't take it, and that's okay. But I would love to go to a laboratory and spend a couple of years testing something. We don't have time. We don't have two hours because there are people dying right now. If it does help, great. If it doesn't help, we gave it a shot. We gave it a shot. That's the way I feel. You know, we passed something. Yeah, I, I would I would be very serious about taking it. Uh, we passed something that I'm very proud of. It's called Right to Try. For 45, 50 years, they've been trying. It makes so much sense. We have the greatest uh, doctors and labs and lab technicians, greatest medicines, the greatest minds in the world. Everybody admits it. And when we're close to having something or when we have something that tests incredibly well, you couldn't use it for years because they would take years and years to test. So with the help of also Democrats, I got it bipartisan, but they've been trying to get this passed for, for decades. You know that. It's called right to try. So a person would be diagnosed terminally ill from something. And in the old days, meaning before a year ago, they would say, do you think I could try this, this pill, this whatever, this medicine that's testing so well? No, you can't do that. You can't do that under no circumstances. They'd leave for Asia. They'd leave for Europe. They'd leave for — if they had money. If they had no money, they'd go home and die with no hope. We got a thing called right to try. If somebody's very ill, terminally ill, they're going to die. They — and it was very complex. It wasn't as easy as it sounds, because there were huge liability problems. The drug companies didn't want to do it because they didn't want it on test results, because these are very sick people. So they didn't want to bring down their test results. The insurance companies had tremendous problems. They got everybody in the room. I said, look, we'll sign a waiver. The person taking it will say, we're not going to sue. The family's not going to sue the drug company, not going to sue the insurance company, not going to sue the state, the city or the federal government, okay? It's called exculpation. And we got it done. It's a very simple agreement. I don't know why nobody ever thought of it, but they never thought of it. I did. And we got it done. Now we have right to try, which is actually, in my opinion, much more difficult than what we're talking about here. But if there's a, a medicine or something, a possible cure or something that's looking good and somebody has something that's go they're going to die or they're very sick, they take it. And, you know, we've had some unbelievable results. Unbelievable results. And it also gives the people hope. Yes, please. Mr. President, the, the doctors who are treating coronavirus patients, they have the medical expertise to determine whether or not they should pres prescribe hydroxychloroquine. And many of them And do. there are already clinical trials in place sure. looking at hydroxychloroquine. Sure. So they should be finished not, in about a year. Why not just let the science speak for itself? Why are you promoting this drug? I'm not. I'm not. I'm just you saying very out. simply, I'm not at all. I'm not. Look, you know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying well, to save lives. You come out here every day, right, sir, talking about the benefits I, of I want them to try it, and it may work and it may not work. But if it doesn't work, it's nothing lost by doing it. Nothing. Because we know long term what I want, I want to save lives. And I don't want to be in a lab for the next year and a half as people are dying all over the it's place. Already out there. Doctors are already able to prescribe it off-label, right. right? All I'm doing so what is do saying, you accomplish? Well, well, I'll tell you what I accomplished. We bought massive amounts of it, 29 million doses of it. We have it coming from all of the labs. We're actually now doing it here. Because in case it does work, we want to have it. And we've given it to uh, drugstores. We're, we're sending it all over. FEMA's doing it. FEMA's doing it. We're doing it through different channels, many different channels, including the companies that make it. So it's a very special thing. Now, it may not work, in which case, hey, it didn't work. And it may work, in which case, it's going to save a lot of lives. Now, a lot of people say if the people walking in prior to getting it, if they take it, it has a profound effect. Well, maybe it does and maybe it doesn't. I don't want to wait a year and a half to find out. And only CNN would ask that question. Fake news. Go ahead. Sir, I, I have one for Bunch you on oil, fakers. but first I was hoping to ask Dr. Burks a question. Um, the President just said that, uh, based on the most recent data, that uh, you've seen some change in, in the projection. Um, I'm wondering if you could you, — you obviously have a week's more worth of data uh, since 
the the sort of 100,000 to 240,000 potential death um, figures that you gave us last week. So I'm wondering, with all the caveats that um, this is sort of based on continuing social distancing and that we might see, you know, if one city pops, things could change dramatically. What what are the, f the sort of range that you're now looking at in terms of uh, total death impact? I think the most important thing right now is when we were talking about why we are hopeful. Well, hopeful because last time I was here, I wasn't able to really tell you that Italy and Spain were coming across their apex and coming down the other side. And I think to me, that's extraordinarily hopeful. They just completed, completed four weeks of really strong mitigation. And I think that's our word to the American people, is we can look like that. Two other countries look like that now. Two other countries with a very similar experience to, uh, to our experience with high ca higher case numbers and higher mortality. So that's what the promise is. The promise is, if we do this, we could potentially be better. Now, Dr. Fauci and I today got another um, update from another independent modeler, and the numbers came in close to that 100,000 number again. But we believe, Dr. Fauci and I, that if every American follows the guidelines, six feet, washing hands, not social gathering, um, that will have an even greater impact. And the other side of the equation certainly is our remarkable healthcare providers, our respiratory therapists, our laboratory technicians, our nurses and doctors. They're saving lives every day. And so that changes the number, too. I also think that Dr. Fauci and Dr. Brooks are very impressed with the American people. And I'm not going to put words in anybody's mouth. I would never do that. But I am, and I will say that they are doing maybe a better job than we all thought even possible. When you look at streets in New York where there's nobody on the street, no cars, no nothing, I see it. You know, I've seen those streets for a long time, and they're packed all the time. And now you see there's nobody. You look at other places. You look at what's going on in California where they're doing a fantastic job. They really are. The governor's doing great. I'm proud of them. I'm proud of a lot of people. I'm proud of a lot of people on the other side, you know, of a lot of people. Uh, really, uh, I'm really delighted to work with people that, frankly, on other issues, I didn't get along so well with. We disagree on this or that. We don't have to go into that now. But we're getting along with a lot of people. And uh, they're happy with us. We're happy with them. But I, I really believe that uh, the American people are doing a better job than anybody would have thought even possible. And that's one of the reasons we can even be talking about the kind of number that we hopefully will be talking about, which is at the minimum level instead of the maximum, or beyond. It's not even the maximum. It's much beyond the maximum level, which would be horrific. Yeah, please. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, Mr. President, uh, please. Secretary Esper mentioned the Department of Defense went, might be moving in the direction of using face coverings by former Vice President Biden and mentioned that he was going to be using a mask whenever he goes out now. Uh, are we getting to a point where we might see members of the Coronavirus Task Force also wear face coverings? Well, it was voluntary, as I saw it yesterday. And certainly, if they'd want to, I would, I would encourage it. I would have absolutely no problem with that uh, if they wanted. We had a long meeting today. Uh, there's good separation. Uh, but the task force meets, and I would certainly have absolutely no problem if they wanted to. I think, frankly, uh, it's something, at least for a period of time, where it might be advisable. And, you know, it's advisory, uh, and we'll see what happens. Yes, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. On Project Airbridge, we've seen reports that Chinese shipments of testing kits and PPE have turned out to be faulty uh, to some capacity. We obviously don't have oversight. Not here. No, not here. No, no but to Spain in particular. Well, yeah, you've seen in Spain, and you've seen it everywhere. They're not sending faulty things to us. So we're not concerned that I'm any not, of the no, PPE we test it. We look at it. We check it out. Please. So, um, one of the things we're doing to prevent that is um, using um, th those six companies that uh, are the ones in the major supply chain. We are actually going to facilities, looking at product, um, inspecting it, and clearing it before it comes here. So, so you, we've we've heard those things. That's why we're that's why we're doing that. Okay, thank you. Uh, a follow up for the doctors, if and we're possible. also sending it to other from other locations. Right. 
And when it comes to the ventilators, which are very complex, uh, we are now building, we have now under construction literally thousands of ventilators. Uh, so, but so far, I think our projections on ventilators have been right. They've been correct. Did you have something for who? Well, for yourself and for Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci, if they want to take a crack at it. Um, some of the models that you guys are using, the IHME model in particular, has been very accurate when it comes to projecting deaths over the last couple of days. But there's a couple of other metrics that they seem to be pretty far off on, specifically hospital beds. Are you guys, you know, happy with the models you're currently using? Is there any need to adjust those? Well, it's turning out that we need less hospital beds. Right. That's what you're talking but about. I, and that's what we, well, we may have models, but we've been sort of saying that. Uh, in New York, we were saying, we think you're going to need less. Now, let's hope that continues. But right now, I heard Governor Cuomo this morning, and he was saying less hospital beds, also less death. That was a very big thing. First time, less death today than yesterday, right? That's a big thing. But also less hospital beds. That means less patients, because basically it's less patients. And we were saying that. And it also means less ventilators. So there's a lot of not a very positive things happening. Okay. Uh, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, with, with Prime Minister Johnson hospitalized, yes. um, I noticed a few minutes ago you were standing right next to Vice President Pence. Are, are you considering staying away from each other just to make sure that we have continuity of government in the executive branch? We, uh, we have this tiny platform, and I'd love it to be wider. You're staying away from each other. Uh, Mike, you attested. Okay. Like recently, so was I a couple of days ago. Um, you keep interacting with we are, groups of we people. Are, we are. We are. We yeah. are. You know, here we are on this platform. And uh, but I get next to him, I don't breathe. No, I'm only kidding. We are. We are sometimes forced into uh, positions that uh, I'd rather. I'd rather be away. But it's. It's. You know. You're all looking for questions. Mike's a very big part of this. I am. It's very difficult maintaining, like, this distance on this little area. I just wanted to ask really quickly, under what circumstances you would consider leveling um, imports, uh, tariffs on imports of oil to the United States? Well, if the oil price uh, stays the way it is because of people that really want to see it go up, when I say get, we want to save a great industry, and we built a great industry in this country, uh, if they don't get along, I would do that. Yeah, I would do tariffs, very substantial tariffs, because we're independent now. We have our own oil. And if I did the tariffs, we, we essentially would be saying, we don't want foreign oil. We don't want any foreign oil. We're just going to use our oil. And that would help to save an industry. And, you know, it's become a tremendous job producer. And it's great to be independent. We're independent. Our energy is now independent. We produce more oil than oil and gas than anybody else than any other country, and that all took place over the very recent time. Uh, now, in the meantime, I'm seeing $0.91, uh, 91 cents a gallon out on the road, okay? Uh, a lot of people are happy. Uh, I see very inexpensive jet fuel. We're trying to save the airline industry. But I want to save uh, our great energy industry, and that's what we're doing. Yeah, so I would, I would absolutely do that. And what we'll do, price will still be very low, but what we'll do is we'll save, and very importantly, we'll save tens of thousands of jobs. One of the other things we're doing is having oil shipped to our strategic uh, oil reserves, okay? And, you know, we're buying it for the right price, and we're shipping it. In some cases, we're storing it for nothing. They're there. We're filling up our reserves with this very inexpensive oil. Nobody thought they'd ever see a price. This is like from the 1950s where they had big dollars, okay? So, no, I would use tariffs if I had to. I don't think I'm going to have to, because Russia doesn't benefit by having this, and Saudi Arabia doesn't benefit by having. They, you know, oil and gas are their major sources of income. So it's obviously very bad for them. But we have to — we have an industry that's a very important industry, and it's really formed beautifully. It was the virus that killed it, because what happened is it's down 40 percent from the day this happened, 40 percent. Otherwise, it would be doing phenomenally well. 
So that's it. Yeah. Uh, Mr. President, uh, can we get an idea of timeline for those people that are waiting for the stimulus checks? Uh, how many more days they may have to wait? And that Speaker Pelosi today, uh, or I think last night, said in the next bill that they would like to see additional stimulus checks made. Have you guys thrown around an amount of how much money? No, but I like the concept of it. I think it's good. We're talking about a different way of doing it, but I like the concept. I like the concept of infrastructure. Our country has to be rebuilt. They spend all this money in the Middle East, $8 trillion. We're up to now $8 trillion in the Middle East. We've got to rebuild our country, okay? We have to rebuild our roads and our schools, our bridges. We have to rebuild our country. So I like an infrastructure bill. I also like money going directly to people. It's not their fault that this happened. And I do think this, uh, especially the faster we could get it open, our country. Can you believe we're talking about our country, getting our country open? Uh, the faster we get it open, the bigger the boom, the bigger the rocket ship going up. I think it has a chance to go really uh, quickly, relatively quickly. I'd like to see very quickly, but we'll see. But part of the stimulus and part of what we're doing, that will help it. And the nice part is we're paying practically zero interest rates. You know, we're paying very little. It's one of the reasons I like the infrastructure bill, because we're borrowing. We have a strong dollar. And the advantage to a strong dollar is everybody wants to invest in this country. They all want to buy our dollar. On the direct payments, sir, just in terms of timeline, are we talking still two weeks? Are we talking 10 I days? I think so. Yeah, from what I'm hearing, that, yeah, okay, a couple of weeks, thanks, that's sir. what I'm hearing, yeah. Uh, please. Thank you, sir. I wanted to follow up on the hydroxy question. Thanks for the numbers. Has there been um, any tension with the medical staff on that? Are they in agreement yeah, with Yeah, we, we discussed it with the staff. We discussed it with FDA. Well, F FDA approved it, so, you know. Which is another point. I mean, it's been approved by FDA, which is very important. If it wasn't approved by FDA, then I couldn't do this. But FDA has approved it, the hydroxy. And also, um, if this turns out not to work, are hospitals and doctors going to be exculpatory from the federal government under the right to try? No, we'll see if it works. No, it's not going to. It's not going to hurt people. It can help them, but it's not going to hurt them. That's the beauty of it. You see, it can help them, but it's not going to hurt them. What do you have to lose? Okay, question you yeah, in the back, please. Yeah, uh, you know, obviously we know anyone can spread the disease, right, unwittingly. Right. So why even have a few businesses open? Why not just shut everything down? There are grocery stores that are open, fast food places. Why even take a little chance? Just shut well, them all down for it We'll answer that question later. All I can say is that right now things are looking really good, and opening up with a bang will be a great thing, and there's nobody going to be happier than me. Uh, please, go ahead. Um, just to follow up on your comments about the ventilators, yeah. um, the IHME model suggests that 32,000 ventilators will be required by the peak in mid-April. Uh, GM is not expected to have ventilators ready. 32,000 will be what? Uh, required across the country. Um, GM, in, in addition to the ones that we've already sent? Just in, in Don't forget, general. we have almost 10,000, a little more than 9,000 right now. And those are ready to rock should we need them. And we had to keep it, you understand that, flexibility, so that if we need them in New York, which we might not, if we need them, but they're ready to move. We have, we're already military, it's a military operation. We are ready to move. They'll be moved immediately into whatever section of the country we need. Would you like to answer that, brother? Yes, sir. So, um, uh, correct, uh, FEMA's working on a plan to, to be able to move ventilators. So, for example, the DOD gave another 500 ventilators. Uh, they're on the move, to, uh, being staged at Fort Dix to be able to, to rapidly deploy them uh, to locations. Um, and to, to include, um, you know, you heard um, the, the President mentioned states giving to states, things like that. Um, so there's, there's the ventilators that aren't in use that, that conceivably we could rapidly move as well. Right. But you mentioned that there were thousands that are currently being made. Um, yes. So I just wondered if there was any update with GM and Ford just because No, they but they're not going to be long. They've started GM, Ford. We have many. We have 11 companies, approximately 11 companies building them. And we're going to have a stockpile for future. Hopefully, we never have to use them. They should have. The hospitals, the states should have bought a stockpile. They didn't do that. So we've made up for it. But if we have extras, other countries need them. I mean, you see, UK needs them badly. France needs them badly. Italy needs them badly. They need them. So. It's complicated. It's a big piece of equipment. It's expensive. And uh, we'll be able to help other countries after we take care of our needs. Uh, yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. 
on infrastructure spending, as you as you have I remarked, actually chose you, but that's oh, okay. Let him go. That's all right. Go ahead. On, on infrastructure, uh, you've remarked about how empty the roads are. Is there any thought? Is there any way to speed up infrastructure? I mean, the Beltway in Washington, it takes forever to do any road repairs because of all no, the traffic. No, I know. Because they don't do uh, construction techniques that work and that are better. I mean, I see a highway, and that's which is what I do. I do construction, what I did. I see a highway. That's good, but it's got a bad top. And it's got a big base, concrete base underneath. And I'll see them come in. I, I don't want to say where, but I could tell you, I could give you plenty of examples. And they rip the hell out of it. They take out the base. They take out everything. Now they pour a new base that isn't as good, isn't as deep, isn't as thick. The concrete base was fantastic. The footing, they, it well, takes well, forever. Wait a minute. Yeah, it takes ahead. forever. And instead of scraping out the asphalt or whatever may be the top, scraping it off and putting the new asphalt down, putting the new median in, they could have done it. And then they, then they open the highway, and it starts to crack. The reason is because it hasn't been set. And they spend 10, 15, 20 times more money than they have to. I, I never believe, when I watch these people doing highways and doing roadways and doing work, how they take the most expensive solution, and the bottom line, the job itself is far worse. What I'm getting at is taking advantage of the fact that so many people are staying at home, yeah. not on the roads. Is there a way to do well, it more yeah, cheaply? Hopefully, they're not going to be staying at home for long. Hopefully, this will be out, and we're not going to have that kind of time. If we have that kind of time, we made a big mistake. Please, go ahead. Um, how many rapid tests has the federal government already deployed across the country, and which reg regions have received those tests? Uh, who has that information? Speak about that. Go ahead, Mike. Um, the 15-minute test has really been a breakthrough. I reflected on um, uh, the progress that they've made in, in Detroit to put first responders back on duty with the Abbott Laboratories test. Um, Abbott Laboratories started uh, last Tuesday producing about 50,000 tests a day. And there's, uh, I'm informed that there are about 18,000 of these machines already all across the country. I mean, they are they're actually the same machines that you use to get a strep test quickly when you go to the doctor. But now Abbott is surging uh, these new 15-minute coronavirus tests uh, out to healthcare professionals and, and healthcare facilities around the country. In addition, as the President said, uh, FEMA has purchased uh, 1,200 of these uh, devices. We're distrib distributing them to all 50 states and the Indian uh, healthcare system. Uh, and, and then we'll be distributing the tests. Dr. Burks, is there anything to add That's further on that? So okay, further. Have already received these tests? Uh, let me ask uh, Admiral Palovchuk about the 1,200 devices. I didn't hear the question. Uh, have That's they received the 1,200, or what's the timetable? Um, I believe they're on the shelf at Abbott, uh, a yeah. good majority of them. Tuesday uh, they go out. Uh, right, yes, sir. So um, I, I don't have the exact numbers. I think there is some manufacturing in there, but a um, large balance of them are on the shelf. Some have gone out, by the way, but the big bulk of them go out on Tuesday. Yeah, please. Sir, in some of these previous briefings, you referred to uh, the federal government as the backup. Today, there's definitely uh, a different approach here, I think, with no. the, the distribution. It all, the sense of it in listening to your presentation today is that you are embracing taking a leader role for distribution. Is well, there a change? No, there's not a change, but we're supposed to be the backup. But like in uh, Illinois, the governor couldn't do his job. So we had to help him. We're sending 600 ventilators. We're building a hospital in McCormick Place. We're doing — so we have some people that we're not able to do. We have other people that needed a little help. We had — in New York, we had to give a lot of help. But we worked very well with Governor Cuomo and with Mayor de Blasio. Uh, but, no. We are meant to be the backup, but we've taken on a much bigger role than that, and that's okay. I, I have no objection to it. Now, in some cases, it's worked so well where they're actually now seeing they think they're over, over the big problem, and they're actually calling us and they're saying, you can take your equipment back now. But we're really deployed as a backup, but I feel we're much more than that. They've done a much better job. I will say this. I don't think that the people that have represented this country, the federal government, uh, whether it's uh, the admiral and 
uh, the generals and all of the people that we call to the fore, I just they sh — they're heroes for what they've done. What they've been able to do in a short period of time, they took a system that was broken, just like we did the military. Our military was broken. Our military was depleted, and it was broken. And we've rebuilt our military. We've rebuilt this whole system, too. And I — in a way, Kelly, I appreciate your question, because you know, you're hearing all of the things that we're the, — the millions of masks, the, the hundreds of thousands of gowns, and they're surgical. You know, they're — they're protective gowns at the highest level. We're getting it to the various states. And most of the governors are very happy. Now, a lot of times, you know, it's politics. Maybe I do the same thing. I don't know. But they'll try and act not so happy. I will tell you, when I speak to them or when Vice President speaks to them, uh, they're singing the praises of all of these people. So I always take umbrage when, when somebody says something about what we've done. Now, to do this, to do this should have taken — to do what we've been able to do and to build it to a level should have taken a year, Could should have taken two years. They did it in a matter of weeks, and we're helping states. No, it's them. As an example, New York had the right to buy 16,000 ventilators. They could have bought them. They didn't. I understand why they didn't. It was a very expensive purchase, you know, a very expensive — and that's a lot, 16,000. And they chose to do something else with their money. I understand that. The problem is when something like this comes along, which you don't expect. Look, 1917, that's a long time ago. Perhaps 100 million people died. That's a long time ago. So people don't think it's going to happen. I would have, frankly — I mean, did anybody in this room think a thing like this could happen? But it happened. And we built up a force. This is a military operation, as it turned out. It really is, with, with FEMA with the Army Corps of Engineers. I mean, Army Corps of Engineers — and you were very gracious on that point. The Army Corps of Engineers building 2,500 units of — of beds and everything else. Now — and then Governor Cuomo called, and he wanted it to go COVID, meaning for the problem. And we said, well, it wasn't supposed to be that way. But we want to get it done. And we move military personnel. So now military personnel are operating it. And I'll tell you what's — what's good. It hasn't been very full. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. It hasn't been. Now, maybe over the next week, something will happen. But it hasn't been. But we have — because it's better than the other alternative, where we run out. But they built, actually, 2,900 beds. And we have uh, — also, we built four medical centers in New York. We built four hospitals, four medical centers, uh, and a lot more than that. It's such an honor to have done it. But the people that did it are amazing, and they have to be appreciated by the states. Not me. They don't have to appreciate me at all. I don't care about me. They have to appreciate the generals, the admirals, the doctors, the nurses. I mean, we're bringing now 3,000 people in that are medical professionals that are coming from all over the country to help New York City, help New York State, and help many other places. I just think it's incredible what they've done. And I don't think that they've been appreciated. Me, you can forget about. Me, yeah, you can forget. Yeah. I, re I actually mean it. They have to be appreciated. Uh, go in the back, please. President, when you said uh, that you see in the lights at the end of the tunnel, and yesterday, you said I, — I do. I do. Yeah, I'd see so, light at the end of the tunnel. If I yeah, didn't, yes. I would not be uh, — I would not be very thrilled with what we've done. No, I see light at the end of the tunnel. I think indications are some of the numbers coming out today. I think, uh, you know, we had a very good meeting today. Uh, we're seeing things that we don't even report because we think it's too early to report. No, I think, you know, we're seeing things happen that are very good. And we also know, all of us, including the medical professionals, that we have to open our country up. We have to get go. We have to open our country up. No country was designed for this. Will you close it? We're in the midst of the greatest economic boom in history for any country. Our country had the greatest economic boom in history. We had the most people working that we've ever had, almost 160 million people. And then from 160 million, they want nobody to leave their house. You know, you could use the term cold turkey, right? That's called cold turkey. A country is not designed — this country is not designed for that. We have to get our country back. And I think it's going to come back 
and I hope it's going to come back very quickly. Sir, Since, yes, yeah, please, go ahead. Sir, um, the First Lady has been tweeting encouraging people to wear face masks. Has That's she, good. Has she been no, talking she feels to you about that way. this? She feels that I, w I would wear one. I mean, I just uh, generally am not in a like I should. Would you like me to wear one right now and answering your question? That would be a little awkward, I guess. But no, I mean, I again, I would wear one if it was if I thought it was important. Uh, she she thinks she likes the idea of wearing it. Yeah, she does. A lot of people do. Again, it's a recommendation and I understand that recommendation and I'm OK with it. What New York. Are they going to be wearing them? Are you encouraging them to wear them? Uh, wouldn't be surprised. Can we hear from Dr. Fauci, Mr. Sure. What would you like to know? If we're going into this most difficult of times, how can the American people sort of emotionally prepare for that? And while the president is talking and is eager to see the country reopen, how do we balance the mitigating factors that still need to take place before we sure, get to that doctor. point. Sure, doctor. And by the way, he's, he'd like to see the company open, too. I mean, you know, Everyone would he's say. called an American who loves our country. Okay, so part of the answer to your, your question, I think, relates to two other questions I heard, and I think it came from the back about how can you, on the one hand, have said yesterday that this is really going to be a bad week at the same time that we're talking about the light at the end of the tunnel. It seems to be inherently contradictory, but it really isn't. And it has to do with what we explained before about the lag in when you look at the indications that Dr. Burks and the President was talking about, uh, where you see a flattening out of cases, and you don't see the realization of what that means until two weeks later. So right now, we're seeing, as we all said correctly, that this is probably going to be a really bad week. That is a reflection of what happened two and a half weeks ago. So if we start seeing now a flattening or a stabilization of cases, what you're hearing about potential light at the end of the tunnel doesn't take away from the fact that tomorrow or the next day it's going to look really bad. So we've got to make sure we realize we're always talking about a two and a half week lag. So I want to make sure, because I think a couple of people asked that question. It's really not incompatible with what we're saying. Now, with regard to what do we tell the American people, what, Kelly, what we've been telling them all along, that the, the only tool but the best tool we have is mitigation. We know it worked in other countries, and we're seeing how it's working here. So if we really want to make sure that we don't have these kinds of rebounds that we're worried about, it's mitigation, mitigation, mitigation. That's the answer. New cities and new states come on the chart? Yeah. What's the message for people in those places that have not been the focus? It's the same thing. It's mitigation, mitigation, mitigation. In fact, he, his, the famous vice president chart is that this is the minimal of what we should be doing. You know, everyone should be doing that. And everything on here, one way or the other, points to physical separation. Whether it's no crowds, whether it's six feet, whether it's staying away from theaters and, and restaurants or what have you. And churches and places it, it, of work. Exactly, exactly. Doctor, are you worried at all about people becoming complacent? Though? Are you worried, I mean, because a couple of days of this, I think people are about ready to go nuts staying in their house. And I'm just curious, are you worried at all that after, you know, seven days from now, people are going to say, look, I gave my best shot, but i got to get out. I mean, You know, I wouldn't say I'm worried about it because I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, from what I've seen, and I mentioned it the other day, my own experience, is that people really understand the responsibility that they have for themselves, for their family, and for the country. So this is about all of us. This isn't just about us. Because if everybody does their part, you are going to not have those kind of rebounds that we're worried about. Yeah. Dr. Fauci, how, how many additional asymptomatic cases do you think there are currently in the United States? There's 330,000 <clears throat> more confirmed cases. How many asymptomatic, given what we've learned? You know, we don't know, and even among us, good friends that we are, <laughs> we, we, we differ about that. I mean, it's somewhere between 25 and 50 percent. Yeah, yeah, in other words, about the people, yeah, about the people that are out there, yeah. And, and trust me, that is an estimate. I don't have any scientific data yet to say that. You know when we'll get the scientific data? when we get those antibody tests out there and we really know what the penetrance is, then we can answer the questions in a scientifically sound way. Right now, we're just guessing. And would you also and we've made great progress with the antibody 
testing. Fantastic progress. And would you also weigh in on this issue of hydroxychloroquine? What, what do you think about this, and what is, the, what is the medical evidence? Can I answer that question? Yeah. Well, I, I Maybe 15, doctor. 15 times. Okay. You don't have to ask He's, the he's your medical expert, correct? <laughs> he's answered that okay. question 15 times. Dr. Fauci, why are you not wearing a face mask? Uh, what do you, why am I not wearing a face mask now? Okay, there are a couple of reasons. One of them is that part of the, in fact, the major reason to wear a face mask is to protect you from infecting you. I had my test yesterday, and it's negative. Good. Okay. That's a very, very good answer. All right. I think that really could be it. That was a very I, I love that answer, especially on the face mask. I thought it was very good. Go ahead. Sir, on the equipment issue, um, records show that federal agencies did not begin. Oh, stop it. Who are you with? By the way, who are you with? with? Press, who are you with? This issue of press. Agencies did begin both purchases of respirators and, and are you ready? masks are you ready? until mid-March. Let me just answer your question, because I know exactly, you know, the same question you ask all the time. Ready? They have done an it's unbelievable job in delivering for the Associated Press, which is, uh, you know, not so great. Not like it used to be. Uh, the people that you're looking at, FEMA, the military, what they've done is a miracle. What they've done is a miracle in getting all of this stuff. What they've done for states is incredible. And you should be thanking them for what they've done, not always asking wise guy questions. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.